weeks ago, we sang the song of the long, rotting conservative movement in the United States. Largely made up of white folk and largely serving wealthy interests, it was incredibly popular in the late 20th century. But as the 1990s gave way to the aughts, the movement weakened. Economic stagnation and the brutality of America mixed together to expose the paper lies of conservatism. Many would leave the ranks, and those who stayed behind would grow increasingly insecure, vulnerable, and willing to lash out. The Republican Party grew obsessed with culture war flashpoints, looking dominant and owning the libs on television. This was facilitated by a robust media ecosystem that allowed different Americas to be fed different versions of the truth. Online, echo chambers were even worse. Online message boards that trade in anonymity fostered a culture of stewing in depression and hatred of women. In the early teens, these shut-ins on 4chan and 8chan were careening towards white supremacy and began to use their endless free time to remote the candidacy of Donald Trump. That man met the moment in 2016. A man better at posting than anyone alive. Under him, the large and small strands of conservatism would find a home, from the few hardcore thousand fascists to the hundreds of thousands of Anon posters to the millions who listen to cranks like Rush Limbaugh and Alex Jones to the tens of millions of Republicans who sit pretty in suburbs and abandon rural parts of America. Trump's rise to power was marked by a rise in conspiracy movements that gave rank-and-file Republicans on Facebook exposure to folks who thought that Hillary Clinton was sent by the devil. These conservatives were energized, and their victory was close at hand. But the first year of Trump in power, 2017, was a flailing embarrassment for the conservative movement. And every day, Trump, their sacred hero, was looking more and more like a fraud. This strange mix of circumstances and stressors would bring us to October of that year, where an anonymous poster would start a rumor that would kickstart a cult. This is the story of QAnon. Welcome, humble listeners, and not-so-humble listeners, to the No One Is Competent podcast, the premier show dedicated to convincing you that everyone in power has no idea what's going on. We are here on QAnon Part 2, the most ambitious project this podcast has ever taken part in. I think it's, uh, this is sweet episode 14. I've always liked the number 14. My name is Azalea, a deranged maniac who loves nothing more than dwelling into the darkest parts of the American nightmare. And I am joined, of course, by our scion of knowledge and truth, Mr. J. Harry's Brunstead. Nice to meet you all. J., I don't know about you, but my 2020 so far has been a bit trash. Yeah. I mean... It's, it's <laughs> been a week. I probably caught COVID this past week, so there's that to to look forward to, or I suppose look back upon. Um, That's through two shots and a booster, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, my man got hit. Yeah. You probably still hear it on my voice, maybe. I guess it depends on how accurate this microphone is. Yeah, Jay had to be ill last week. I simply had to uh, settle for being mentally ill, uh, which is, is fun. I I, tr- um, I had a birthday recently, and uh, after the party, uh, I did a little... Uh, I, w- I was a little fast and loose with... Um, with a few chemicals, and uh, I um, no. J- Jay, you know what it's like to go non-linear, right? No. Or, or like, you know when you get so high that you like completely lose object permanence? No, not really. Okay, so you know when you have an ego death experience, and your entire personality and font of being melts as it's being crushed into an infinitesimal space. And you question whether or not you're even real and whether or not your life will continue? I can't say that I do now. Well, it wasn't pleasant. And that kind of, uh, I don't know, that kind of jostled out some dark spots in my mind. But I'm here. um, I'm unfortunately not queer. And I'm ready to make the best goddamn podcast we ever had. This is, of course, a sequel to our part one episode one of the jokes we have in this podcast is how much context we like to give for events. QAnon, of course, is a very important historical event. 
that is only made possible because of just tons of factors that were going on in America at the time. So instead of making a giant ass podcast that only got to Q and on halfway through, we made an entire podcast work of prequel shit, essentially context that we will expect that, you know, going through this, we will start with Q and on in this. We will jump straight in. I promise you should just be, uh, just be glad we didn't start off with like the anti-federalists or someone. Our story begins with mankind finding out that agriculture was a mistake sometime in 11,000 BC. A dude in Mesopotamia ate some rotting barley and got really high. This inspired him to seek out more. <laughs> how how much credence do you give the the beer is responsible for agriculture uh, theory? Uh, not much. I would like it noted for the record that Jay has a crippling addiction to sobriety, and thus all of his opinions on said matter uh, are not to be trusted. This is all to say we have a super fun show ready for you y'all today, but. Before we go, we got to plea. We got to get on our knees. It was my birthday last week. Go on to Apple Podcasts. Give us a review. Give us five stars. It really helps other people discover us. Go on to YouTube. Subscribe. Like. No one is competent. You don't have to listen to the podcast on there. But if you do, you do get some handy dandy... Uh, visuals and whatnot that I throw in there in the editing process sometimes can bring things to light a little bit more and maybe uh, secret video game reviews if you uh, watch uh, to the end which I'm pretty sure no one does can I ring that bell can you imagine how sad <laughs> someone would have to be to have the bell rung on our podcast <laughs> I have the bell rung on our podcast why <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Like, I got, I was a YouTube power user before the bell was a thing. And, like, I have the bell rung for, like, six other accounts, all of which are VTubers. Because it's, it's actually somewhat, no, you know, nice to get notifications when they start streaming. If you're already on YouTube anyways, you know. You should try just having autism and an obsessive memory that just sort of keeps track for you when <laughs> everything you care about goes live and starts and also be terminally online and constantly yeah. checking back on your feeds yeah. constantly so you don't need updates you just sort of get them anyway that's uh that's that's my personal strat uh anyway jay tell the people how they can contact us on the social medias and interwebs and emails and whatnot uh, well, you can find us on Twitter at uh, twitter.com slash not underscore competent. And our email is no one is competent at gmail.com. Um, you can also find us individually on Twitter uh, at Jaharis48 and at like the word weaver, correct? I, I don't remember your handle. Is it why does Alia? No, it's my Twitter my Twitter handle's not not important. I haven't been tweeting good stuff recently. I I I, I my, my my Twitter is not fire enough to promote it on this podcast. We will promote it on this podcast is that our music, that beautiful intro song you heard coming in, and that beautiful outro song you'll hear when you listen to the whole podcast through, which is the thing you'll totally do, is by the legendary Sam Bryce. Not Hyde. He was very offended by that, you know. He, he like <laughs> not Sam Hyde. He fan. wasn't. He he has it. He he has it. He has it. Who I forget. Who is Sam Hyde? Is is he a comedian important? or something? I don't. Uh, we're gonna find out that that. Uh, you know what? Let's get to the episode. J Jay, read the first. What what part are we on? Uh, part twelve. It seems. You know. Now that we've made an entire seventy-minute podcast of context, we finally get to talk about QAnon. On October twenty-eighth of twenty seventeen, a user posted to Four Chance poll board, claiming that Hillary Clinton would be arrested in around three days' time. This user presented no evidence for their claim, only that their intel came from possessing Q-level clearance within the American intelligence community.
It's worth noting that the Anon on the Chan board claiming to be someone with high-level security clearance was far from new. A user named FBI Anon had posted a similar claim before the 2016 election. It's also worth noting that while Paul was the nexus of fascists and online Trump supporters, many of which were young and had only recently been politically activated, this was far from the largest Trump-loving community. It did, however, sport full anonymity, with the user only identifiable through a string of numbers called a trip code. On most days, a post like this would be ignored, but instead it caught wildfire, and the user, an anon known as Q, began rapidly posting a series of short statements and questions, such as, Why does POTUS surround himself with generals? HRC detained, not arrested. Yet. Many in our government worship Satan. Why is the National Guard called up in 12 cities? And trust your president. On the next day, October 29th, Q would begin one of his drops with, Some of us come here to drop crumbs. Just crumbs. From there, he would spew another sequence of short, barely coherent messages about how many powerful politicians and business leaders would be swept up in an indictment orchestrated by or with President Trump. That's how it started. Just a guy on an anonymous messaging board. QAnon became so powerful because it was a lot of things to a lot of people. Hope, obsession, purpose, meaning, and excitement. But above all, the movement provided narrative and community. Follow me here. In the next few days, Q would post hundreds of times, and across years, that would constitute thousands of drops. To a logical person, most of these drops are complete nonsense. They're a soup of conspiratorial references to old CIA projects, code names, and questions that go nowhere, like asking readers to trace bloodlines of prominent politicians or to discover the real reason for World War II. Every time they promised real answers, hinted a coming revolution the likes of which America had never seen, they swerved back into vague and repetitive mumbo-jumbo. I know you're wondering what these Q posts are like. I know you're really curious as to who Q is. We'll get to both of those questions, but we want to convince you that the answer to them doesn't really matter. What matters far more is who was paying attention. And going forward, we're going to be referring to the person authoring the drops on 4chan and 8chan as Q. QAnon is going to refer to the movement and phenomena in general, and those who are unironically following the Q drops and believe them to be true are going to be referred to as the Q faithful. Let's talk about them. Part 13, The Cult of Q. Most people would assume that the Q posts were nonsense trolling. They were made up as part of either a grand delusion or elaborate joke. But if you believe that Q really was a high-level government operative with the knowledge of a coming purge that would reshape the country, it was clear that he couldn't speak about it directly. Q could not simply explain what was going to happen. He had to obscure his message. He had to leave crumbs, bits of information, hints at where to look. He would ask you questions to get you looking deeper. He was giving you, yes you, the clues to uncover the grand conspiracy. Sound exciting, right? Q didn't just spell out instructions or inform folks as to what was happening in the recesses of the government. Q gave people something to do. His drops were a puzzle for the reader to interpret. He provided crumbs, and now it was up to you to bake them into something concrete. Yes, some of them called it baking. No, that does not make any sense. Please get used and ready for lots of stupid stuff. Yeah. Now, after Q left's poll for the day, the board would erupt with attempts to interpret what he meant. The Q drops would be archived and spread throughout the net. Independent websites would log and categorize all of them to make sense of the madness. Soon, the bug would spread to the other Chan boards, most notably 8chan, where Q Research would become one of the top boards, and on Reddit, on forums such as r slash the Donald, where President Trump was worshipped as the God Emperor. 
Some of them were joking. Some were not. From late 2017 to early 2019, Q would post at an almost constant rate, a few hundred posts a month, most of them short phrases or questions, falling in clusters every three to four days. It was almost like a TV show you could tune into every week to see the new updates on the real news the mainstream media wouldn't tell you. It's easy to see how this strip feed of content could keep followers engaged, and how Q's vague questions could encourage conspiratorial thinking. Q hinted to a highly secret government operation that only a few top officials knew about, but if Q was leaving hints to the grand plan, there had to be more out there. Trump left a random Q in one of his tweets. That's all the proof you need. Q is the 17th letter of the alphabet, so you should look for the letter 17 constantly. It's worth noting that a lot of Q's rambling are obviously false or easily disproved. And the pieces of media we'll get into in a sec that popularize the QAnon conspiracy often came with even wider leaps of logic. This creates a sort of self-selecting phenomenon. Those with the critical thinking skills or training to see through obvious lies, or who are a little more educated on history or science, don't get sucked into Q, and thus aren't around to question things in front of other people. We're not saying the Q faithful are exclusively dumb or uneducated. Rather, that the average American is quite dumb and very uneducated. The Q faithful were a very average slice of the American pie, especially as it grew in size out of the depths of the internet. Much of the movement's most effectively evangelizing content could be found on YouTube by creators like Praying Medic, Neon Revolt, or Jordan Safer. These early videos were poorly made explainers, attempting to put the Q conspiracy in simpler terms and catch new folks up on the meaning of the weekly Q drops. Many followers wouldn't try and interpret the crumbs themselves, but instead would wait for their trusted baker to do the interpreting for them. Again, the language is dumb. All of this is dumb. Dumb stuff is very important, which might actually be like the subtitle for our podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Just like the 9-11 conspiracy movement, video explainers were key to spreading awareness of the Q conspiracy. Specifically, a film called Fall of the Cabal, which hyped up the epic nature of the Q plot and how it related to every other conspiracy, converted followers wherever it was posted. 4chan had stopped being one of the web's most influential sites long before 2017. And despite their fanaticism, the citizens of Poll represented a fraction of a fraction of Republicans, most of them young and not nearly large enough to sway an election. But over the coming years, QAnon videos would be spread to more and more mainstream parts of the web, from Reddit to YouTube to Twitter to Instagram to Facebook. And it was on Facebook where Q would amass his oldest and most important followers. Many of these folks were traditional conservatives who you'd characterize as a classic crank. Your crazy uncle or old bus driver who listened to Alex Jones and would spin yarns about the problems of government. But there was a surprising diversity of the Q followers. While the movement was almost certainly male-dominated, there were plenty of women involved at all stages of fanaticism. It was a mostly white crowd, but ran the gamut of age and background. Old redneck living in the American heartland, young man posting for hours a day in their parents' basement, young woman from San Francisco with an Instagram loaded with yoga influencers and new age healing practices, suburban moms picking their kids up from soccer practice. You'd find all of them amongst the Q faithful soon enough. It even went beyond the borders of the U.S. of A., Despite its veneration of the American president, Q faithful began to show up in New Zealand, Australia, Germany, Great Britain, and especially in Canada, where several terrorist threats and subcults can be attributed to Q's influence. A note on its whiteness. Because you could always find people of color amongst the Q faithful. They were there, and they still are there. For example, many of the QAnon marches would be organized by a self-described Native American rapper, but there weren't very many of them, and they usually existed in the more mainstream parts of Q, such as Instagram. 
The inner core of QAnon was always the far-right sham boards, and later Parler, where talk of Q was constantly anti-Semitic, and wouldn't have been out of place in a white nationalist Discord server. And the Q cult often served as a way for mainstream conservatives to rub shoulders with fascists, which you definitely should not be worried about. Definitely don't be worried about that at all. Don't, don't think about it a, a single, 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 single time. Uh, Nothing bad uh, could uh, ever come out of that. Now, another note on the group's background. Based on their beliefs, you'd probably expect the average Q faithful to hail from Oklahoma or Tennessee, a rural conservative. But the movement was also quite attractive to folks in the West Coast cities or with New Age beliefs. We're not saying that there's tons of them, but you'll find more people believing in star signs and crystal healing in Q than you'd think. This is to say that Q would eventually get so big that painting it in broad brushstrokes gets hairy at times. This was a community. At first it was just a bunch of people trying to interpret cryptic messages, but soon it became chat rooms and the audiences of influencers that lasted for years. In January of 2018, Q would use a slogan, where we go one, we go all. And that would quickly become the rallying cry of the Q faithful. When social media sites started to crack down on hashtag QAnon, followers quickly moved to hashtag WWG1WGA. Very catchy. This phrase, along with trust the plan and the storm is coming, were fun verbal handshakes that those in the know could use to signal each other. It's impossible to state how much of this was shaped by the social media and influencer era. Influencers were essential to spreading knowledge of what QAnon was. Not a lot of people want to troll 4chan to interpret cryptid messages, but pop in a Facebook live stream to watch an attractive person explain the secrets of the world? Why not? All social media companies are partially culpable for the spread of QAnon, but Google's YouTube and Meta's Facebook bear special blame for allowing this kind of content to fester on their platforms for years without action. Some of the influencers came from the pre-existing conservative media sphere. Some of them came from previously existing conspiracy movements like Flat Earth. And even more were just random folks who hit go live on their phone. They helped to steer the interpretations of the Q lore. And more importantly, they sold a lot of merch. Like, more merch than you could possibly imagine. You want a mug that says, where we go on, we go all on it? You want a Q decal for your truck with the American flag colors as, as the Q symbol? You want shirts, hats, novelty knickknacks? You can find dozens upon hundreds of people hawking it online. I actually ran into, like, props to buy Q merch while I was researching this episode. <laughs> Did he get any? Well, you know, the one that had the boots, the, the shirt with the boots in front yeah. of American flag and said, these boots are made for stomping. Uh, I was a little tempted by that one. You're a little tempted. But, uh, didn't, did, didn't, um, did, didn't, didn't, didn't add to cart. It's a, it's a shame. Like most conspiracies and everything involving the Trump presidency, QAnon was mostly a graft with folks in it to make a buck. But whoever at the top was profiting, it's worth noting that over 2018 and 2019, the Q faithful were growing steadily into larger and larger section of the country. And they were a cult. Now you protest, you say they're not a religious movement. Well, as we're going to get to, they believe a lot of religious and mythological things. You say they're too big, that there's not a single cult leader, and you're right. There were hundreds of cult leaders all circling around the cryptic figure of Q. We think QAnon is a cult, and you can come to your own conclusion with the information we'll give you, but we think QAnon shows what a cult will look like on the scale of thousands and millions of members. It's more watered down, sure, but it's pervasive, and as we'll see, capable of believing some really out there shit. Before we move on, I just want to like summarize that QAnon was kind of a lifestyle for a lot of people. Like, in many ways, it's a fandom um, where you can just totally insulate yourself in the Q ecosystem. You can follow Q people, you know, in 2019, you could follow Q people on Twitter. You could listen to QAnon podcasts about decoding. You could sort of, like, build a, the Q bubble. 
and you had plenty of people to talk to about it. You had a place where every crazy idea you ever thought would be taken seriously, be thought of as valid, which was very redeeming and, and nice to a lot of people. And it, uh, you know, allowed them to get even more fanatical and be believe even crazier and crazier things, which uh, we're going to get into. Part 14, what they believe. We've been putting this off for as long as possible, but it's time to tell you exactly what the QAnon conspiracy entails. Ladies, gentlemen, and non-binary folk, we ask you to buckle your seatbelts and keep your hands and legs inside the vehicle at all times. At its heart, the Q faithful believe that most of the world, both now and in the past, is controlled by a shadowy group of people called the Cabal. Most rich people and politicians of both political parties in America are part of the cabal. George W. Bush, Obama, and certainly Hillary Clinton are all cabal members. But the group also contains their associates, along with billionaires like Bill Gates and Hollywood celebrities like Tom Hanks. The cabal pulls the strings of the world economy and are behind most wars and incidents, all intended to keep hardworking white Americans down and in their place. The Cabal worships Satan, and they are pedophiles across the board. The Cabal has in place massive networks of agents to groom and traffic children to the Cabal, allowing them to molest these children and sacrifice them to their demonic lords. Part of this sacrificial process involves the Cabal extracting from the kids a chemical called adrenochrome and using said chemical to stay youthful and healthy. The one rich person who isn't a member of the cabal is Donald Trump, of course, who was elected to the presidency against the cabal's plans. Q constantly stressed the importance and genius of Donald Trump, who is working against the cabal throughout his presidency. Incidentally, they also believe JFK to be the other non-cabal president, and that the cabal was behind his assassination. According to the Q narrative, the cabal was a deep state that Trump often railed against. They controlled the media, and Congress worked against his agenda. But Trump was fighting back. He was working with the Department of Defense and FBI to take down and expose the entire operation. In secret, the Justice Department was compiling a list of hundreds of sealed indictments, all with irrefutable evidence of the cabal's many crimes. As soon as these indictments were all compiled, law enforcement agencies across the country and across the world would move in concert to arrest the cabal members in a massive operation called the Storm. The Storm would uproot every facet of American society and expose the evil of the cabal in a way that would unite humanity against them and behind Trump. Still, there would be resistance. The Cabal would use their resources to fight back, and National Guardsmen would be deployed to cities all across the country to quell the riots that would surely break out. But in the battle, Trump's side would surely be victorious. The Cabal would be exposed, indicted, and most of them would actually be executed. After the storm would be the Great Awakening, where Trump would usher in a new golden age. Cabal technology would be used to cure every illness, and America would be restored to its rightful place as ruler of the world. Exposing the evil of the Cabal would also eliminate all political divides, as the righteousness of Trump's movement was made obvious to everyone. With the cabal dead, Trump would be finally free to make America great again. That's a lot. Let's unpack it. First off, you probably noticed that the cabal is just a retread of the Illuminati, the Wizard People, and the Freemasons. The idea of a shadowy group of people secretly ruling the world is the oldest conspiracy theory in the book. I mean, I know I spent a lot of time when I was younger on rather shady sites like Above Top Secret, which is now mostly a Q site, um, just looking at people talking about reptilians and UFOs and the New World Order, and most of that just translated right into Q. Now, part of mm -hmm. what made QAnon successful is that none of the ideas in it were really new. They were just a repackaging of beliefs that already existed in America. Those who know their fascist conspiracy theories can recognize the storm as a repackaging of the Day of the Rope or the Racial Holy Roar and the Great Awakening of the Classic Golden Age that is promised once all of this comes into the open. 
Secondly, let's note how violent this idea is. The Cabal are Satan worshippers that rape children to death and then harvest chemicals from their blood. It's a group so cartoonishly evil that any violence against them is immediately justified. And QAnon doesn't just promise these individuals arrested, but publicly executed, often without mention of trial. Like a lot of conservative and fascist movements, QAnon is an excuse to do violence against people you don't like. But it's key that you won't be doing the violence. On his second day of posting, Q said, Patriots are in control. Sit back and enjoy the show. The movement is highly trusting of law enforcement and the military, often fetishizing their aesthetics. And they're very comfortable with extra-legal violence, often behind the veneer of military law or military tribunals. It also praised most members of the Trump administration and painted them as loyal foot soldiers, all working in secret to diligently expose the cabal's many crimes. Those working against the cabal are usually called patriots, though, to be clear, that's just really a conservative buzzword that means people we like. <laughs> or people that are with us. <laughs> QAnon is a very comforting belief system. Yes, there is evil in the world, but God-fearing Trump supporters are in control, and they will vanquish this evil any day now. Just keep waiting. You may have noticed that Hillary Clinton was not arrested in October of 2017, and Q would steer away from hard dates as his grift went on. But he would always insist that the storm was near. It was key that patriots trust the plan, as he said, and wait for Trump to execute his masterwork. Next, let's acknowledge that the tropes Q is trafficking in bear a lot in common with classic anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. A lot of racists believe the Jews are pulling the strings of the world. And Q himself would invoke plenty of anti-Semitic dog whistles, and many of the communities that discuss the Q drops were very open in their hatred of Jews and other minorities within America. The adrenochrome thing itself is basically just a retread of the myth of the blood libel, where Jews would sacrifice Christian babies. But here's the thing about the adrenochrome angle. Q never mentioned it, not even once. It was kind of spun up by the side material of Q, and one thing we want to reiterate is that what Q said doesn't really matter. What matters is what his adherents believe. QAnon is what we call a big tent conspiracy theory, where previous conspiracies and side plots can be folded into the main whole. 9-11 truthers and flat earthers quickly found fertile soil within QAnon, along with new beliefs. For reasons lost to history, many Q faithful came to believe that JFK Jr. was still alive, and working with Trump to take down the cabal. This belief is quite persistent within QAnon, despite numerous attempts by Q to say otherwise. So, so many attempts to say otherwise. But they care so much about it. So much about it. Like, they're... Uh, whatever. There's plenty of little aspects to the Q lore, from the importance of Saudi Arabia, to Operation Mockingbird, to mole children, to miracle beds, and a lot of it shifted in importance as the conspiracy went on over the years. It's a constantly growing and shifting set of beliefs, and it's so big that almost no one believes all of it, or even knows all of it, partially due to the fractured nature of the Q faithful. These people were numerous, they were decentralized, and they were often getting their info secondhand. And this allowed little side myths and beliefs to be kind of spun up in the larger miasma of Q lore. Even though it is all originally coming from one Q person, th this system of beliefs is really more of like this kind of decentralized myth-making system. I think it's better to think of it that way. But... They did all come from the quote-unquote Q drops. And uh, maybe, I guess, do you think I, I, I have um, I, I, I have a big database of Q drops here in front of me on my computer um, because that's where my life is <laughs> now. Um, I, guess, I guess maybe I should, uh, should yeah. I read some of them for... Uh, Let's let's pick a random um 
Okay, yeah, this is let's, let's do something early on, because all of the best Q drops are early on. Afterwards, they would get... whatever. November 4th, 2017. Martial law declared in SA. SA is probably Saudi Arabia. Why is this relevant? How much money was donated to CF by SA? How much money was donated to John M. Institute by SA? How much money was donated to Pelosi Foundation? How much money was do donated to CS by SA? S uh, CS is probably Chuck Schumer. Whatever bad actors have been paid by Saudi Arabia? Bribed, not just Dems. Why did the Bush family recently come out against POTUS? Who is good? What are laws in Saudi Arabia versus U.S.? Charged criminals? Question mark? What information might be gained by these detainees? Why is this important? What force is actively deployed in SA? National Guard? Question mark? Have faith. These, the crumbs, in time, will equate the biggest drops ever disclosed in our history. Remember, disinformation is real. God bless. Alice and Wonderland. The Great Awakening. So, like... That, that's actually one of the more coherent ones. There's tons of questions. There's tons of abbreviations. This sort of like rapid fire nature. It, it's all kind of a soup. So much all caps. <laughs> so, so many caps. Why is POTUS focused on SA slash China slash Russia? Question mark. Why? And let's count them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 question marks. Why is Russia being used against POTUS? Question mark. Why Russia? What damage can Russia do to Dems? What damage can China do to Dems? Iran? Question mark. North Korea? Question mark. Why does Hussein travel before slash after P POTUS? Related to foreign trips. Use logic. Why is POTUS focused on bringing back manufacturing? Jobs? Security? Control? True control. Who can you trust? The world is not how you view it. Trust the plan. We are ri winning. Arrests will come. Logic should answer why it must follow other. Unfolding events. Learn and spread. Build proofs. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, those are, um, th those, those are the statements of, uh, Q, um, and, 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 um, you know, but, but, but the QAnon guy himself, that, that, that doesn't really matter. So listening to those, it is actually like really uncanny to me how similar the language is to just general conspiracy talk on forums and like the late 2000s, early 2010s internet. You know, the stuff going for like FEMA death camps, if people remember from the Obama years and stuff like that. Like just the way that's actually written reminds me of those. I mean, there is a reason that QAnon took over like every other conspiracy movement in its time. Like it was, it just fit perfectly into the vein. Yeah. Now we arrive at part 15. Okay, but who is QAnon? It doesn't matter. Stop caring about it. Bazilia, the people want to know. It doesn't matter who Q is. What matters is what he made people believe. What he made people do. He's not worth talking about. I think you might be wrong. <sighs> Fine. Okay, so this is the part of the podcast that has contained the most opinion and speculation because we cannot be completely certain who Q is, at least in the beginning. I say that because it's clear that multiple people have written for the Q account over the years. That's clear because of changes in writing style and things I'm going to go into in a bit. I also want to talk about the kind of guy Q was and... It, it was a guy. It just was. It probably changed hands many times. Um, it And the later guys were definitely way lazier. Like, in the later years, a bunch of Q drops would just be, like, links to stuff Trump said on Twitter and you know, tons of hyperlinks and, and just, you know, kind of responding to things rather than steering the conversation himself. But let's talk about who Q was. I fundamentally believe that the original Q poster was a troll. Someone who wanted attention. That's all he wants. It's fun to cosplay as a government agent with secret information. 
This was not uncommon amongst the chants. FBI Anon did it just a year before Q, claiming that Hillary Rodham Clinton would be arrested. It happens constantly. There were folks who jumped on the bandwagon after Q, trying to pose the different government operatives. None of them really caught on, but it shows the popularity of the bit. Um, the The first day of Q posting was very chaotic, and it took a while before like the proper Q trip code got set up. So there might have been several people in uh, that initial bit before one of them kind of like became the official Q. Um, once the original Q post got an extreme amount of traction, I think the original poster or posters, if they were all kind of working together, decided to double down on everything. Maybe because it was fun, or maybe because it was profitable. Beyond anything, it had to be a power trip, you know? Like, all these people thinking you're part of a secret plan to save the world, they're hanging on to your every word, arguing for hours over what you meant. That's enough to make anyone feel good about themselves. Whoever Q was, he was committed to the bit. Q posted hundreds of times a month for multiple years. This person was committed, and even though they were lying, they certainly shared most of the political beliefs of their audience. I don't think Q could have posted for as long as they did if they weren't at least a fervent conservative and fan of Donald Trump. Above all, Q praised Trump as a near-divine figure who should be trusted at all times. Q also shared a love of law enforcement and the military, and a distrust of big tech, the media, and more or less every other politician elected before 2016. Q clearly hated Hillary Clinton, and most of the early content in October of 2017 was about Clinton specifically, and then he branched off from there once he needed new material. Q kept up with national political news and often tailored his drops to match the daily zeitgeist. A few months in, Q became heavily invested in the Antifa menace and believed that Antifa and, well, black people would rise up in riots once the storm started. When he wasn't being casually racist, Q would put his spin on most big conservative news points involving Trump. When the Mueller investigation started going, Q insisted that Mueller was a white hat, that's what they call the good guys in their world, secretly working with Trump to expose the cabal. When the 2018 midterms rolled around, Q implored his audience to vote for mainstream Republicans, stressing the importance of a, quote, Red October. Through this year, he would make more predictions, none of which would come true, but that didn't seem to bother his followers, who all pressured each other to trust the plan, no matter what. Q easily wiggled out of every contradicting statement and invented new arcs to distract his audience. By 2019, the Mueller report fell flat and Q moved on to Spygate and attacking Planned Parenthood. There was always another move, another post. I want you to think about what could have motivated a person to do this for years. Whoever Q was, they weren't very smart or actually knowledgeable about the intelligence community. Q is called Q. At first, they're like like the Q guy uh, on, on 4chan. Uh, they were called that because they claimed their intel came from having Q-level clearance within the intelligence community. I think they just chose that letter because Q is a cool letter, or at least one that doesn't get a lot of use. You know, it's, 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 it's iconic, you know, Q. It's, it's something that stands out. It's a good meme. But Q clearance is a real clearance in the U.S. government. Within the Department of Energy. My dad used to have Q clearance when he worked at the Savannah River site. It'll get you a lot of knowledge about American tritium refinement procedures, but it's less useful in learning about sealed indictments meant to take down a massive conspiracy. Jay, so many people have Q clearance. <laughs> like, yeah. thousands upon thousands of people have Q clearance. It's not a big deal. Yeah. In January of 2018, there was uproar on 4chan that the site had been infiltrated, and this caused Q to migrate to 8chan, where he would drop all his crumbs into the future. Remember, 8chan was the site of the main Q research board, and at first this just looked like an excuse to get closer to the audience. In this period, there was also a lot of speculation that Q was Edward Snowden, who had appeared in the drops. This theory soon evaporated, 
and at least Q's belief seemed in incompatible with the man. In April of 2018, the Q account would be hacked, and several folks posted under the account. Q would whitelist a new password shortly after, but if there was any opportunity for the account to change hands, it was now. Several people have come out claiming to be Q for those first six months of posting. Some of them claim it was a group effort, some claim they alone were in charge. Some say it was all a long con troll. Others claim it was an attempt to revitalize the MAGA movement after this, the discouraging fallout of the Charlottesville rally. None of them have definitive proof to back up their claims. We do have significant evidence before and perhaps after the hack that Q was a man named Coleman Rogers. Rogers was one of the first influencers who made their fame interpreting and evangelizing the Q drops in the early days, like the really early days. He, he wasn't one of the biggest ones, but, but he was there early on. We have evidence of Rogers screen sharing an account that could have been logged into the Q trip code, and maybe he had knowledge of some, quote, real Q posts that hadn't used the official trip code. Most of this evidence has been lost over time. The people who once compiled it are quite credible, even if Q wasn't Rogers, and we don't definitively know it was him. It makes sense that Q would be one of the people interpreting the drops and making videos about them. In that way, QAnon could be a racket, create nonsense, and then tell folks what it means for fame and profit. In 2019, several fascist spree killers would post manifestos on 8chan before going out to commit their crimes. The first was the New Zealand Christchurch shooter in March of that year, second was the synagogue shooting in California the next month. In August, a killer would post a manifesto to 8chan right before driving 10 hours to El Paso to murder people in a Walmart parking lot. For months there had been a campaign to pressure the company Cloudfare to take 8chan off of its internet hosting services, and on August 4th the company capitulated. 8chan had its domain revoked, and around the same time, this looked like the end for the site. It's worth noting that much of the campaign against 8chan was led by the site's creator, Frederick Brennan. Remember in part 1 we said he's a good guy? This is where the claim comes from. It was in October of 2019, as 8chan foiled to get back online, and others fought against that, that most people learned about Jim Watkins, the site's owner. Remember, Jim Watkins bought A-Chan after its surge in traffic in 2014, and he made most of his money owning various sites based out of the Philippines, where local laws suited him. Jim Watkins would appear before Congress that October, and would also release several YouTube videos about the relaunch of A-Chan. Jim Watkins is in his 50s and knows nothing about internet culture, other than that it's profitable to run the Japanese language porn sites, based out of a country where porn doesn't need to be censored. It's generally believed that his decision to buy A-Chan in the first place was motivated by his son, Ron Watkins, who was a power user of the site. When 8chan re-emerged as 8kun in November of 2019, Q resumed posting on the site, as if nothing had changed. Uh, also, I'm going to call it 8chan going forward regardless, because acknowledging 8kun um, the name and knowing why it's named that opens up just a black hole of sorrow in my <laughs> soul uh, that threatens to suck in everyone around me and collapse the fabric of the universe. That feel about right, Jay? Uh, I'm not upset about knowing where the name comes from. It's culture. This 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 is what gets me about Jay. He's just a fucking psychopath, man. <laughs> he he's just like 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 like. He just just stare into the font of depravity and just eat fucking chips and watch <laughs> it burn. This guy's fucking... Anyway, the whole time 8chan was down, so was Q. He could have gone back to 4chan or dozens of other sites, many of which were begging for his presence and figuring out ways to secure his account, but he stayed on 8chan. Like, like for over six weeks, he did this. And this means that at a bare minimum... When that happened in 2019, but probably way before that, Q was one of three people. They are either Jim Watkins, Ron Watkins, or a person so loyal to Jim that them being a different person does not matter. Q is Jim and Ron Watkins. 
Q quickly became one of the primary focuses of 8chan, and by puppeting the account themselves, the Watkinses could ensure that their figurehead never left or did anything unprofitable. They could simply milk Q for internet traffic for as long as it was convenient and use it to boost their own profiles in the world of conservatism. That's who Q is. It's very boring. Now back to the important stuff. Part 16, The Rising Storm. Just before we get, but just for my own personal... When do you think you first learned that QAnon was a thing? I don't remember. When was the I first I don't think I... I don't think I heard about it until like early 2019. It was probably pretty late. Uh, it was it was probably 2018 for me, but I don't know exactly. Um, probably just before you, because like I do use like Reddit and occasionally 4chan, um, less so back then. But so that sort of stuff does come into my radar um, relatively early on, though I I couldn't put a date on it. Yeah, and, like, you probably just didn't think it was important for a long time. Like, I, it, you know... <laughs> yeah, it was just, like, another weird, like, Trump thing. Like, a MAGA thing. Like, yeah, oh, this is, like, a new MAGA thing. Like, it, it, it's bad, but, like, it's just, well, you know, whatever. Now, that same year, 2018, they were first spotted in the wild. April, in fact. Yep, folks started noticing those at Trump rallies who were wearing shirts or waving flags with a big Q emblazoned on it. But it was just a few here and there. Roll on to 2019 and their presence grew, surely and steadily. It's impossible to know how many there were, but there were an increasingly vocal minority of rep Republicans, always identifiable by their branding. Their activity online also increased and grew more extreme. The racism and interest in violence of the Q faithful would provoke action by the social media companies on which they trafficked. Reddit clamped down in 2018, but by that point Q had spread to actually important parts of the internet. <laughs> We're going to take a break from factual reporting to insert a bit of opinion, but we believe that much of what made Q dangerous was it worming into the way of the minds of middle-aged white Americans, who were mostly normal Trump voters in 2016. Anon's posting on 4chan and Reddit are overwhelmingly young, relatively pathetic individuals, is not that these folks do nothing in the real world, but it is rare. And there's just not enough of them to make a difference. But on Facebook and YouTube, Q could affect people in their 40s, their 50s, their 60s. And these people are far more likely to take action in the real world. Let's talk about those actions. The Q faithful would start out as just a faction of Trump's base before splitting off to hold their own rallies, marches, and conventions. You know, they, they started at the Trump rallies, but... Soon enough, they're having rallies of their own. Many of these conventions were hosted by Q influencers, often jockeying for primacy, and they often teamed up with other conspiracy movements and conspiratorial causes to boost numbers. Uh, the marches and rallies had a more direct purpose. Q said, quote, trust the plan. But if you believe that there was an organization out there that was trafficking thousands of children for the purpose of rape and slaughter, I think you would personally take action. By 2019, it was common for the Q faithful to jam up human trafficking and child protective services hotlines with misplaced fears about the cabal. These calls began doing real damage to the cause of protecting children and distracted a lot of resources away from really helping kids. After Twitter started suppressing the WWG1WGA hashtag, Lots of Q faithful began using hashtag save the children and hashtag save the kids to promote Q beliefs. These actions exposed an even wider audience to Q and got a lot more people mixed up in the movement through what they thought was a purely positive hashtag. While the Q movement started around wanting to see Hillary Clinton behind bars, the focus shifting to protecting children both gave the group far more members and a convenient shield. I live in the city of Augusta, Georgia, which has a massive human trafficking problem, mostly sex trafficking, but trafficking of all kinds is a real menace in our society. Every year, millions of children around the world are molested and taken advantage of by adults who don't deserve to breathe. These are real problems that exist in the real world, and they need to be addressed, but the Q movement was nothing but a diversion. If you confronted them while they marched on the street shouting down with the cabal and save the children, they'd accuse you of not caring about kids, of not recognizing the problem of human trafficking, and... 
thousands more concerned citizens and parents be drawn into the cult. It's very frustrating. Many people have compared the rise of QAnon to the satanic panic of the 80s and 90s, just with a new generation of parents, and there's a lot of credence to that. Think of the children is a great way to motivate people to take very stupid actions. And it also allowed the Q faithful to think of themselves as righteous protectors. Now, none of these marches numbered more than a few hundred people, but they weren't the end of Q activity. Far more alarming were the individual actions taken by the Q faithful. We began to see a spate of incidents where Q followers would become paranoid that their own children were at risk from the cabal and would kidnap their kids from school, divorce spouses, or child protective services and take them on the run. There is more incidents of individual violent action than we can name. One man held up traffic on a bridge and demanded the government release secret documents. One member of the Canadian Armed Forces broke into the grounds of the Prime Minister's residence and stalked the grounds with a rifle. Much of the Q cult assumed that the cabal was all-powerful and everywhere, which is highly damaging to individual people. By 2020, some of the mainstream media had began covering the Q movement and focused on how many people were falling down the internet rabbit hole. There were soon hundreds of stories of seemingly average people becoming consumed with videos about conspiracies and Q. They'd sit in front of screens listening for hours, investigating further and further with new Q drops every few days. You know, there's no reason for them to leave. In many ways, Q was just another fandom or niche internet community that produced enough content to consume people's lives. Except Q often funneled people into contact with terrorists and white nationalist groups while telling them their children were going to be eaten by Hillary Clinton. We also saw the Q cult beginning to drive a rift through individual families as it affected the minds of users. Q followers began seeing the influence of the cabal in their daily lives, making them increasingly paranoid, especially for folks that have, say, mental conditions or disorders. I have quite a few relatives who would be very susceptible to that kind of thinking, and I count my blessings that they did not fall for this kind of thing. As their internet research uncovered deeper and darker revelations about how the world really worked, they would get more and more drawn in. When family members would interfere, the Q faithful would go on incessantly using the catchphrases and insider parlance of internet groups, leaving family members confused and baffled. Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter would take some action, removing videos or restricting accounts, but new content and posters always rose to take their place. From 8 to Instagram, the Q movement was only growing. Part 17, 2020. It shouldn't surprise you that the COVID-19 pandemic would throw gasoline on everything we've mentioned above. Conspiracies in general would thrive as a plague from beyond America's shores locked down the entire country. QAnon had long since become a movement too big to be fully coherent. The war was so large and shifting that no one believed everything, and fringe beliefs could be folded into the Q narrative and spring up independently, independently around it. Q beliefs also flowed in and out of mainstream conservatism, which was becoming rather conspiratorial these days. I managed a laundromat during the pandemic, we did not close down, and let me tell you, thinking that the virus was a hoax or a plant for political reasons is not restricted to age, gender, or race. I can just tell you that from what I have seen. Um, <laughs> there were a lot of times, you, you know how like people was like, I, I gotta take a break, I gotta go for a cigarette break? Yeah. Um. There were a lot of times during uh, 2020 where I had to go for a stupid break. I, I had I, I just heard shit in the laundromat that was just like, I'm literally just gonna walk to the back of the building and 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 just listen to music for a bit because I I cannot. That's fair. Most of this spawned from President Trump, who actively spread misinformation about the virus and discredited many trustworthy experts on the topic. Q himself would jump on much of the bandwagon. When Trump promoted the false cure of hydroxychloroquine, Q followed suit, and the Q lore would soon expand to include much of the conspiracies around COVID, from lab leaks to ivermectin. Q rallies and Save the Kid marches would intersect with the anti-lockdown protests that would erupt across the country. 
After the murders of George Floyd, citizens across the United States would unleash one of the biggest protest movements in the country's history. And as they cried for justice, conservatives and fascists would rise to counter these protests. These clashes between activists and the far right would inspire more people to find out about QAnon. But by that fall, many in the movement were looking forward to what they all assumed would be the start of the Great Awakening, the 2020 election. Now, we have to stress how much of this was actively encouraged by Trump. The man spent months before the election priming his voters to believe it would be covertly rigged against him, and there would be massive voter fraud across the country. You know, we talked a little bit about this in our uh, Capitol Riot podcast. It's almost like we planned this shit ahead of time and, like, <laughs> is, is all orchestrated and we're really yeah. smart. Yeah. Perhaps. We're not now, that smart. <laughs> <laughs> you are. And then this increase in conspiracies across the GOP base, coupled with COVID paranoia, would drive many to Q, but eventually the country would get so conspiratorial that Q would start to feel like a sort of minor player in it all. Q had long I, I just since... want to interrupt to say I think that's actually the first like unprompted compliment that Jay has ever given me in my entire life, and I think my my worldview is shattered. <laughs> but keep going. And then it's probably because I'm still sick. <laughs> now Q had long since ran out of original material, and now the movement was being propelled by influencers and politicians with far higher profiles. Profiles as high as the head of state. The weird thing about the Q movement is that as it grew, it began to turn to a very different focus from where it started. But then as it reached its height, it kind of got subsumed by the rest of what was going around at the same time. By November 3rd, 2020, QAnon was no longer the largest conspiracy movement in the United States. The Republican Party was. Part 18 crackdown. Q spent much of the fall railing against Hunter Biden and planting ideas that the election would be rigged, much like before. And after the election, the Q movement would firmly follow the script of the rest of the Republican Party. The Trump campaign would scramble to undermine the results of the election throughout November, leading to prominent grifters to take over Trump world and the Q movement. Folks like Sidney Powell, Lynn Wood, and Michael Flynn would kind of force out a lot of the more grassroots Q influencers as people at the heart of the movement. As the QAnon sort of world began to heavily intersect and overlap with the larger Stop the Steal conspiracy movement that we talked about in our January 6th episode, um... One of those guys, retired General Michael Flynn, is an individual stupid and fascinating enough to perhaps warrant an episode of his own, <laughs> but he was featured in many of the early Q drops, and in 2020, he would begin pandering to the Q crowd indirectly, or not so indirectly. General Flynn kept at least a little bit of deniability from being full QAnon, but eh, I mean, the guy's been getting money from all kinds of circles. Uh, maybe random people on the internet are a step up from <laughs> just being a asset of the Turkish government, but you know. If you ever, if you ever want Whatever. To, to, to say a thing for you and you have the money, uh, you can always get General Flynn. Real patriot, that guy. <laughs> yep. Powell and Wood had been popular in Q circles before the election, but gained new prominence as lawyers who claimed that Trump had technically won the election, and there were legal ways of reinstating him as president. And this demonstrates how folks can slide between the Q sphere and broader republicanism, and how the function of the Q faithful within Trump's GOP was to be the most loyal, genuine followers of the president. As we'll soon see, they were also among the most violent. In the space between the election and the inauguration, it occasionally felt like the world was ending. There were riots on the streets of DC, with fascist Proud Boys clashing with counter-protesters. Obviously, there's a lot of overlap with QAnon in that group, and every group like, like that. We've spoken of the QAnon movement throughout this video, 
But as much as QAnon was a community, it was rarely incompatible with others. So you'll find that the Q faithful scattered throughout any conservative or fascist organization. Again, QAnon wasn't really driving the bus at this point. It was rather that they had all been swept along with Trump's Stop the Steal movement that was just inflaming all of his supporters. Many Q followers assumed that the storm was upon us, and whatever was going to go down was about to happen. They waited so long for Trump to imprison all of his enemies and unleash the Great Awakening. Either that was going to happen before he left office, or he wasn't going to leave office at all. Th there is a logic to it. During most of these events following the November election, Q was disappointingly silent, and after December 8th, the QAnon account would go dark completely. That's it. After December 8th, no more Q drops. The movement stumbled in the dark and glommed on to the closest shred of hope, keeping Trump in office. We've already covered what happens next, but QAnon was involved in the rising tide of violence that winter. Q influencers are part of the circuit of violent protests that ran through the year. Specifically, I know a lot of you want to know about the Q shaman, the guy in the buffalo hat. That dude was a minor Q influencer who showed up at a lot of Q adjacent events around the country. He likes attention. He got it. End of story. Q followers were also amongst those speaking of violence running up to the six on sites like Parlor, 8 Coon, and Facebook, and every corner of the net. On the approach to the Capitol riot, many Q followers relayed their willingness to die for the Great Awakening they anticipated. January 6th is in many ways the climax of the QAnon story. The end of a trend point, the payoff of the buildup. We had seen gatherings of the Q faithful before this, but those marches and conventions were mostly peaceful. QAnon followers had taken small violent actions, a kidnapping here, a terrorist threat there, but the damage had been mercifully small scale, and this day would be deadly. At the same time, it shows Q at its most rudderless. January 6th was not a Q action, it was a Republican action with Q followers along for the MAGA ride. With Q silent for weeks, the Q faithful were left to their own devices. Leaderless, the Q movement urged each other to simply show out on the 6th. Gathered together with so many of their fellow believers, thousands of them, it would be easy to believe that the storm was here, and that the golden age they were promised was ripe for the taking. These emotions fired their spirits, allowing them to overcome the measly defenses of the Capitol Police and punch their way into the building. They hunted for the members of the Cabal, especially Mike Pence, who the Q faithful were convinced held the power to reverse the election. They crashed their way to a windowed door that stood between them and members of Congress. They screamed at cops and smashed through one of the door's side windows, allowing someone small to vault through. Ashley Babbitt had a hard time adjusting to civilian life ever since she got out of the Air Force. For reasons only she would know, she found Trump to be an electric figure and reveled in his 2016 victory. In the following year, she would spend much of her time in the labyrinth of Q narratives. She would talk about Q to her friends, family, and even business clients, often leaving others shirking away from her. Her beliefs cost her business and relationships, and so she dove deeper into the only place where the world made sense. She went to the Capitol in January, ready for her life to have purpose again. Suddenly, she was surrounded by those who understood her, praised her. She attacked on the front lines, ready to make history, to be one of the loyal patriots who took down the cabal. When a hole was torn in the glass, she signaled to her comrades to lift her through. The Capitol Police officer on the other side was nervous and panicked. He had never seen this kind of security breach before. The enemy was loud and violent. His leaders confused and disorganized. Adrenaline pounded in his brain. When Babbitt emerged with the glass, he pointed his weapon and he did what he was trained to do. The round caught Babbitt in the chest. She shuddered and fell back to the floor. The crowd behind her reacted in horror to the gunshot, even more when they realized she was bleeding. Between the nip of the bullet and the jolt of the fall, her brain didn't fully realize what was happening. She reached out to another, told them she was okay, that it was okay. She didn't know what she was feeling. Her chest was hot, but her limbs were cold. Then colder. Then the strength left her. And she was gone. 
QAnon was a system that lured in people by playing into all their worst biases and prejudices about the world. It gave them solutions to the problems that plague their lives and promised to finally show them what was really going on in the world, a chance for them to finally be as important as they wanted to be. It gave them a community, a task, and a leader to trust. It provided them endless streams of content and discussion that could supplant the relationships in their offline lives. It gave them a holy crusade to embark on and a promised land to seek. It took their time, it took their money, it took many of their relationships and careers, and it delivered some of them to their death. Ashley Babbitt was not the only Q follower to die on the 6th. Almost all the MAGA casualties of the day could be linked to Q rhetoric in some way, as it had snaked its way through the Stop the Steal movement. There's evidence that even the police officer who died that night was later found to have a parlor account following Q propaganda. No, we don't really know exactly how to feel about that either. There was of course no grand plan waiting for the rioters as they took the capital. If you want the full story of how they broke in and what happened before, And after, we already have a podcast for that. For all their work, the Q faithful were ejected from the building before nightfall, and that would be the end of their accomplishments. Also, shoutouts to us for recording that podcast on January 2nd and saying in that podcast that new stuff was going to be coming out for the rest of our lives, and then having new stuff come out in the week (laughs) following the recording of that podcast that directly contradicted some of the stuff we said in that podcast, like (laughs) the thing about sedition charges, that was really great. Really great. Really fun. The Capitol siege was a mass trauma to the nation, and it would be followed by a mass reaction. All of the people in charge who had let the mess fester under their watch would scramble to look like they were in control of the situation. After years of profiting off of conspiracies and cults, social media platforms would rush to block, ban, and remove, censor Q content, along with the general purge of far-right media. It was clear that Biden was going to be president, and everyone in big tech wanted to be on the right side of the new regime. Of special importance was the removal of chat rooms and groups, mostly on Facebook, that were especially key to discussing Q. Several independent websites related to Q also lost their hosting and would be scrubbed from existence. If you question the heads of Alphabet and Meta, if you grill the leaders of Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, Snapchat, they'll tell you that they've done wonders to scrub Q content from their platforms, and they're committed to preventing disinformation. For years, they had folks telling them internally about the terror rising on their platforms, about how their algorithms fed people down rabbit holes to this kind of content. Most of these videos and groups violated platform rules by advocating directly for violence against groups of people, but they were left up for years. Facebook and YouTube are responsible for this, and you should never let them forget it. Q was silent throughout this process, and is silent today. In a matter of days, Q influencers were deplatformed and Q content was scrubbed from the polite side of the internet, like it was never there in the first place. Part 19, Slow Fade. The inauguration of Joe Biden spelled the real end of the proper Q movement. Q made plenty of predictions that never came true, but this was a betrayal that could not be overlooked. For many, the spell was finally broken and they logged off. Around January 12th, the following post was made on 8Qun's research board. I'm going to read it in full. It uses a lot of jargon, but I think it kind of illustrates the language of these people and how they thought about things. Here's the post. Last stop is coming. Train's still going, but fewer and fewer people on it. They're starting to fade away, one by one, the ones that can. First the quiet ones, the ones on the periphery who mostly lurked. They're already gone. Next, some decide it was all bullshit. Cause here's the thing, they always kinda knew Q shit wasn't real. They just enjoyed the party, the memes, the bants, the breads. Once the pleasure's gone, they're gone. So they go second. That's about when a chunk of the Q leaders and e-celebs disappear because they realize they need to move on to the next gig. Pretend they never cared about Q. Alex Jones already jumped ship. Q? Never heard of it. 
After that, it's a slow bleed as threads die, empty, and forums slash boards clear out, and even the fucking emails don't get answered. Some don't really leave, they just forget to care for a few days too long, and vanish. And no one notices. Soon it'll only be the people too broken to leave, or the people who gave up so much they have nowhere else to go. The bottom feeders come in then, offering hope for money and attention until the money and attention dries up. Wood, Powell, Flynn, smiling faces with dying souls, willing to say and share anything to get you to listen to them for just a little bit longer, willing to give you just one more sip of hope, no matter how insane it might be, and the diehards all drink it up. I hope this is real, they cry, clinging to their profits in pure desperation. Once the survivors get our suck pale, the lights go out and just keep sitting there, insisting it's bright as day. That's the last stop. No leaving then. You've paid too much for the ticket. Even if deep down you always know the plan wasn't really real, never made sense, not really, too late, can't give in, you'll keep the faith. The efforts were weak, new fags and shills didn't believe enough. You're not weak. You're a real diehard anon. That's why you're staying. Bread's never baked. Drops need reanalyzed, then re-reanalyzed, then re-re-reanalyzed. Check the flight logs one more time. Maybe Q meant something else. Check the unsourced news article. Just wait until Biden is inaugurated. That's when the storm really begins. Come 2024, it's really going to go down. Three years delta? Let's try four years delta. Maybe five. Q is quantum. Time is fluid. Ten days of darkness. Any day now. Pope was arrested, but it's mass the next day. Cloned and replaced. Deep fakes abound. Maybe your family was replaced by clones. And that's why they hate you, of course. The deep state got to them. Of course, they can't be wrong. They have to be wrong. No, no use reconnect with them. They're too far gone. Q wouldn't like that. Q has to be right. No, you can't leave because you're not strong enough to walk through the open door because you have to admit that you were the mark all along that you were actually duped that you wasted the last four years of your life holding a key that had no lock lap stops coming still time to get off the Q train call me a demoralization call me a chill whatever you fucking want but deep down, you know in your heart, there isn't a single lie in this post. And come January 20th, reality will finally come crashing down on you. A lot of the folks got off the train at this point with the lack of new Q posts. The Q posts had the course long been authored by Ron or Jim Watkins, who had clearly grown bored of the affair. I suppose QAnon had just gotten too toxic for them to be worth it anymore. Jim Watkins put out a few rambling and barely audible YouTube videos about the election and QAnon. In one of them, he essentially says, QAnon was the friends we made along the way, which is pretty hilarious. I'm not making that up. I ain't making that <laughs> shit up. We are. I, I swear he basically said that. He basically yep. said that shit. Jim and Ron Watkins trying to become influencers circling the Stop the Steal movement. They were involved with the effort to recount and overturn the election in Arizona and have begun seeking elected office in that state. It's clear they want to move on to more mainstream Republican fame, though I doubt they'll get it, and we won't be following their story for much longer. I doubt either of them had the ingenuity to start QAnon, but it's clear that they hijacked it at some point, using past posts as a template to steer the Q followers in circles for years probably reveling in the power and tangential attention. Besides infamy, I doubt they'll ever face any consequences for their actions. You are free, of course, to remember their names. Most of the grifters have either moved on from QAnon or changed tactics. The Q-Pi is smaller now, but those remaining are the most delusional and diehard believers. A lot of them are getting sucked into smaller cults like the Moonies, Numerologists, and other fringe movements. Now that the big tent has collapsed, all of its constituent parts are slinking back off to their communities. Catholic, fascist, flat earth, ancient aliens, 9-11 truthers, all business as usual. Some still trust the plan. Biden's a white hat. Maybe the whole Biden presidency is fake and Trump's still in control. The Q movement continued into 2021 and into 2022, but their conferences were generally paired with other conspiracy movements to bolster attendance. If you're wondering how they can hang on, even as evidence against Q's predictions becomes overwhelmingly obvious, this is 
kind of how cults work. Uh, there have been countless cults over hundreds of years where members continued to believe after disasters, mass suicides, false doomsday predictions, and the arrests of a leader. Once people are bought in, admitting that they are wrong is more painful than staying with the lie. But yeah, there's a famous um, book on social psychology called When Prophecy Fails. That's a study that was based on a relatively obscure UFO cult called the Seekers who believed in the imminent apocalypse and analyzing what happened with its followers after that apocalypse did not happen. Um, this book was published in the 1950s and it's really influential in the, in, you know, the whole field of studying cults and how they think. And one of the common things is that when prophecy fails, you do have the people who are left just double down and become even more dedicated to the cause in spite of the seeming irrationality of it all. Yeah, it, it's a very common part of human behavior. Yeah. Now, nothing about Kiranon was unique. It was simply a collection of conspiracies that had already existed. We demonstrated that with Pizzagate. In following years, Q branding itself may fade from memory, but the people remain. When mainstream social media companies scrubbed Q content from their services, most of them migrated to sites like Telegram and Signal, where Q communities are still going strong. There they mix with the groups already using encrypted messaging services, fascists, white supremacists, and terrorist gangs. 2021 was a relatively cool year for domestic terrorism in America. I don't know when the next hot year will be, but it'll arrive sooner than you want it to. Part 20. Consequences. We've outlined how QAnon was spread by the social media era and how many folks gained fame and money off its rise. Most of them have moved on to a new grift at this point, while others have taken their particular cult into a deeper stage of control. Of course, what is the highest form of influencer, if not a politician? And dozens of the Q faithful ran for office in 2018 and 2020. The vast majority of them were unsuccessful, but they came from across the U.S. In Georgia, Hawaii, Massachusetts, California, Delaware, Rhode Island, Oregon, and others. Especially Arizona. Like, like, like so, so many in Arizona. Y'all have a problem? I say that as a guy who has spotted Q stickers around his town. <laughs> Y'all have a problem. A few of these folks ran as independents, but mostly they ran as Republicans against Democratic incumbents, mostly in districts where any Republican candidate wouldn't stand much of a chance. There are some theories that when conservatives live in areas dominated by liberal voters, they become more extreme. And while a lot of like, the stuff correlates well. I'm not really convinced of that, but it's true that Q candidates were found in districts of all stripes. 2021 saw the rise of conservatives taking express interest in local offices and school boards. Much of this movement is populated by Q folks who have moved on to the hip new thing, and I wouldn't be surprised to see several small and medium-sized towns become partially controlled by folks who were fully Q-pilled just a year or two ago. Of course, the highest profile success of QAnon has got to be the election of Marjorie Taylor Greene, who, after being a minor Q influencer, went on to use her personal wealth and exuberance from Donald Trump to secure the seat of uh, Georgia's 14th congressional district. A and I just said, I'm from Georgia, and yeah, I'm familiar with MTG. I just want to say that she is representing the northwestern corner of the state, uh, no one lives over there. It's just mountains and hicks. Not rednecks. Hicks. Learn the difference, you fucking ingrates. She's sitting pretty in her seat going forward. Her national profile and charisma to those folks probably insulates her from being primaried. The Democrats are going to grift millions of dollars trying to unseat her, which will also not work. I imagine she'll stay there until she gets bored, seeks higher office, or is arrested, which considering her political strategy as being a product provocateur is you know likely we're stuck with her in the ever q politicians for a while most of them downplay their past views but their continued existence is a signal for what is allowed in the republican party 
Laura Boebert also won Colorado's third congressional district in 2020. During her early candidacy, she appeared on many podcasts and YouTube channels that promoted QAnon, though she has distanced herself from the movement. Like Green, Boebert acts as a provocateur in Congress, and I imagine she'll be quite successful, especially as she seems a bit better at picking her battles than Green, but whatever. By far the greatest damage done by QAnon is to individuals. The cult inspired more child abductions than could be counted, along with assaults and attempted murders on top to di disruptions to cities and harassment of individuals, but I think that pales in comparison to the damage followers of Q did to themselves. I understand if you don't want to shed any sympathy for these people. I myself find it difficult at times, really most of the time, but at this point we've seen countless examples of the isolation Q draws people into. It's impossible to calculate how many families have been damaged by a member withdrawing into Q and becoming enthralled by conspiracies, how many lives were consumed, dollars spent, hours wasted on the vain hope of a better life. The Q cult dedicated themselves to this movement and often made it central to their lives. Many of them went to prison for the movement. Many of them are not speaking to their families for the movement, all for a prophet who is trolling and a god who will never know their names. They are victims too. We might be giving you the idea that the Q narrative is over, and with Q silent and Trump out of office, we have entered at least a distended coda, but the story goes on. The past few weeks have seen Q influencers like Lynn Wood and Michael Flynn openly few of each other in a desperate attempt to grift more money and remain relevant. Uh, this November, an offshoot cult of the Q faithful gathered in Dallas and seemed to be concentrating fanatics around a leader who is only growing in his control. You can still find folks who believe in Q, though most won't talk about it as most of their communities have been disrupted. If you wish to follow the Q narrative and associated matters, we recommend the QAnon Anonymous podcast. The good folks over there have been documenting and explaining the movement for years with charismatic flair. They provided much of the research for this podcast episode, and their format helped inspire the birth of this entire podcast. They have our, or at least me, Azalea's respect, and we suggest you check them out. I quite like them too. I have not listened to most of their episodes, but I did um, also come across their work when doing a little bit of research into this episode. A big fear amongst those who study QAnon is that the mass banning of their accounts has squeezed them into even more fringe communities on encrypted messaging services, where they can join the ranks of hardcore white supremacists and Nazi terrorist groups. No one can know how much that's come true, but the next time we'll have a year like 2017 or 2020 where fascist groups feel like violence favors them, well, we'll find out then. And the West extreme members of the Q faithful are still walking amongst Americans. There were thousands of them, maybe even a million or two of them. They didn't all up and die. When another theory or movement comes around, they could take up its banner. The cycle could repeat, or maybe it won't. We can't tell the future. It's tempting to believe that QAnon was only made possible by the cult of personality that Trump inspired, by the force of his charisma. And that could be right. You know, I might believe that QAnon couldn't have arose in the America of the 50s or the 80s or even the aughts. But all of the constituent parts for QAnon were around then, and they're still around now. In many ways, they've gotten worse. Pizzagate happened before QAnon, and the anti-Jewish conspiracies they were based on are hundreds of years old. There are still plenty of Americans who are isolated out there, stuck in media bubbles that are distorting their version of the truth. There are plenty who, who are feeling the strain of our society, where wealth disparity is only growing larger and are growing desperate for a way out. They are still plenty rooted in the old bigotries of racism and the like, who have bought into false tales of their own superiority. There are those who are mentally ill, vulnerable, and easily influenced. There are those near the breaking point searching for a way out. And there are those who will take advantage of them. The Q faithful were right about one thing. One thing we're all feeling. There's a rot in this country. 
A slow moving sickness that's debasing all of us into more vicious selves. It's the rot of hierarchy, of competition in myopic thought. There is a small micro click of wealthy people controlling the world, but their actions are often taken out in the open, trying to be as boring as possible, making life as difficult for the average man or woman so they're so caught up in trying to feed their kids that they don't look up at who's screwing them. Everything that came together to build QAnon, every instinct, theory, and movement is still around. If we do not address the rot of fascism, racism, and zero-sum thinking in our country, all of those factors will rise again as another movement with another face and another name. And when it does, it will make everything we've outlined in this podcast sound like a child's fairy tale. We are the No One Is Competent Podcast. Do not trust those who claim to be above you. They let us into this mess, and they'll do it again. This podcast episode and its prequel were the result of dozens of hours of research and writing, but it was only made possible by the reams of articles, videos, and podcasts that have been made by other journalists and creators out there who have been documenting QAnon for years. This was an attempt to put together all of the actually hard work done by others, I wanted all of it to kind of be in one spot, one place you could go that we split into two episodes where the entire Q narrative would be accessible. But to be clear, any mistakes or errors in this podcast are our fault. Uh, I'm going to list off the people whose work helped uh, put this podcast together. This list is not exhaustive and is in no particular order. And there's probably lots of people who I don't even know about who influence people who influence these people or things that I've forgotten and they're not in any particular order. But to my knowledge, we rely on the work of Jane Coaston, Ian Danskin, Anders Angsley, Alex Kaplan, Dan Olson, Robert Evans, Katie Stoll, Edward Tian, Daniel Harper, David Bell, Cody Johnston, Liv Agar, Annie Kelly, Julian Field, Jake Rock, Tansy, and of course, Travis View. That, um... That's that's it. Jay, yep. uh, where, what should the people go do? Uh, well, as always, you can find us on Twitter at not underscore competent, and you can reach out to us with episode suggestions there or at our email address, which is uh, no one is competent at gmail.com. You can listen to our podcast on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, and a bunch of other platforms. And of course, you can also rate and review us on these. Our music go is do by... it, go do it, go <laughs> do it, go 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 do it, you bastards. Indeed. Our music is by Sam Bryce, and you can follow both of us individually on Twitter and YouTube. And my Twitter username is jharris48, same from YouTube. And Azalea can my be found... Twitter user na- my Twitter username is at azalea wyatt uh i used to make videos at wyatt the word weaver that's probably going to be defunct for a while before i come back to the new channel in a few months but uh you know if you want to hear somebody make a uh, really bland boring video essays go check it out i don't give a shit we uh we're fucking burnt uh we've both been ill and sick and we're recording this at 11 p.m um because uh we think this is important. I think this is important. I've been obsessed with this subject uh, for months. Um, friends and family of mine, J- Jay will know because I spend a lot of my time rambling to Jay that we've, um, I- I've been thinking about this and wanting to explain this for a long time. And hopefully making this podcast will exercise this from my head and I can be free <laughs> to get obsessed with something else. <laughs> yeah. That's the hope, right, buddy? It's It's the hope. All right, folks, Um, we hope this podcast was useful to you and please recommend it to other people if they ever want to know what QAnon was, how it started and whatnot. And hopefully I can uh, end this call and uh, hope that I didn't leave anything out and that we made a solid product. Jay, tell me everything's going to be okay. Everything is probably going to be okay. Fuck you. Everybody, take care. Be fine. Okay, podcast is over. Goodbye.